Good evening, everyone. My name is Kevin Butterfield, and on behalf of George Washington's Mount Vernon, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, the organization that rescued Mount Vernon in the 1850s and continues to protect and preserve it today, I want to welcome you to this conversation about George Washington's farewell address. On September 19, 1796, George Washington announced to the world that he would not seek re-election to the presidency. His letter to friends and citizens offered some of the most thorough, thoughtful, even inspiring advice that has ever been given to the American people. And more than a few genuine warnings were included there as well. A good number of the hopes and fears that remain with us as a nation are discussed in this now 225 year old document. Much of what we debate and discuss in 21st century American politics is addressed here in one form or another. In recognition of the 225th anniversary of this document, we brought together an incredible lineup of talented scholars to reflect on the relevance of the farewell address today. We're joined by John Avalon, an author, columnist, commentator, senior political analyst, Phil an anchor at CNN, appearing on New Day every morning. He's the author of books, including the one we'll uh, discuss tonight, Washington's Farewell, a new book on Abraham Lincoln coming out next February. His work is going to be important to our conversation here tonight, as will the work of Lindsay Trevinsky. She's an expert on the cabinet, presidential history, U.S. government institutions. She's a senior fellow at the Center for Presidential History at Southern Methodist University and a professorial lecturer at the School of Media and Public Affairs at George Washington University. She's also a Kundrun Open Rank Fellow at the International Center for Jefferson Studies in Monticello. Dr. Chavinsky is the author of the award-winning book, The Cabinet, George Washington and the Creation of an American Institution. Joseph Ellis is one of the nation's leading scholars of American history, the author of more than a dozen books. Ellis was awarded the Pulitzer Prize for Founding Brothers, the Revolutionary Generation, he won the National Book Award for American Sphinx, his biography of Thomas Jefferson, and his most recent book, The Cause, The American Revolution and Its Discontents, comes out tomorrow. All of our guests are great friends in Mount Vernon. We are so pleased to be able to offer uh, signed copies of their books. Uh, so please uh, look for links in the chat that can help you find those. Uh, and also, of course, be, please feel free to visit us anytime at mountvernon.org. Joseph Ellis, John Avalon, Lindsay Trevinsky, welcome. Hey. Hey. Thanks for having us. Well, we're here to discuss a really important document in American history, um, and it is the farewell address. I gave the tiniest little preview of what it is, but just imagine someone's just coming into this conversation right now. Um, what is the farewell address? John, I'll turn to you first. What's, what, what is this text? <laughs> um, it, it is uh, America's original civic scripture. It was the most widely reprinted document uh, in American history, including the Declaration of Independence for around the first hundred years of the Republic. And it was the sum total of wisdom that George Washington had accumulated in a life of war and peace as president that he put down, uh, working first with James Madison and then primarily with Alexander Hamilton as a, uh, a warning to his friends and fellow citizens, which is how he addressed it, about the forces that he feared could derail the democratic experiment going forward. And it is one of the most prescient and relevant documents you can imagine. So even though it fell out of favor for a time, I think when it's read today, you see it is a stark warning about, among other things, the dangers of what we would call hyper-partisanship, excessive debt, foreign wars, foreign interference in our elections, uh, and then also suggests uh, some of the pillars of liberty, things we can draw upon to avoid those uh, traps, uh, a remembrance of, of the primacy of national unity, the importance of morality and virtue, uh, the importance of fiscal discipline, and the importance of political moderation and a foreign policy of independence. So that's that's what I'd say it's about. These are a lot of themes we're going to explore tonight. Uh, let me turn to you, Lindsay. Um, George Washington created this text, although, as John mentioned, there are other authors. Could you tell us a little bit about um, the moments leading up, or the, the years leading up to this, because this is a moment where he decides not to be president any longer. Uh, could you sort of, as a, as a great scholar of uh, Washington's presidency, set the stage of those last months or days of the Washington presidency as he's thinking about this address? Sure, well, I think the most important place to start was that Washington really didn't want to stand for a second term at all. He had wanted to be in office for a couple of years and then hightail it as soon as he could. He both didn't particularly like being president because he had to be away from home. 
he had so much stress and pressure on every single action that he took. He knew that every step would establish precedent for those that came after him. He did not like criticism. And he was worried that this reputation he had spent decades building would be damaged by um, a poor choice or a poor action. He also had a real commitment to the importance of him leaving office while he was alive. He felt very strongly that the American people needed to choose his successor, that it could not come through his death, that the process of transition and election and peaceful transfer of power had to be learned and practiced and cultivated. And he was determined to try and oversee that. So that was sort of his mindset leading up to 1796. And he had set his mind quite firmly that by early 1796, he was leading and decided in February and March of 1796, while Alexander Hamilton was actually in Philadelphia to argue a case in front of the Supreme Court, they had a conversation about this address and sort of got the process rolling and shared a series of drafts over the next several months and then sat on it until September, um, partly to sort of keep the election season as short as possible. And um, Washington then finally published it in the newspaper in September to reach the maximum number of people, to make it clear that he was speaking to the people, not to Congress or to a different branch of government. Joseph Ellis, we'll be spending most of our time talking about the text itself, the kinds of themes uh, that we find there. But what can you tell me, uh, what would you add about the origins, the, the what led up to the creation of this document that you might want to share about Washington uh, before 1796? I would venture to guess, uh, John is a student of modern presidents, he might contradict me, but no president in American history did not want to be president more than George Washington. <laughs> Uh, not only, as Lindsay has said, did she not, he not want a second term, he didn't want a first term. And when he was going up to uh, then New York, he said he felt like a prisoner going to, you know, jail and um, execute. And he really meant it. Uh, and if you read the Washington correspondence during the presidential years, almost half of them have to do with Mount Vernon. That's where he wanted to be. Um, he really did. Um, uh, all of the views of the presidency are shaped by a more 20th century conception of its significance. Washington did not regard the presidency as the capstone of his career. He regarded it as an epilogue, one that he wished he didn't have to do. Um, the great thing he did was win the war. Um, uh, I think that's true of all four of the presidents, first four. Adams's great thing was before the revolution to bring it into meaning. Um, Jefferson's was the Declaration. Madison's was the Constitutional Convention and the Federalist Papers. And so all of them didn't think about the presidency as the great moment in their lives. Um, and Washington was an aficionado of exits. Um, he, you know, in surrendering his sword, or even before that at Newburgh, refusing to become dictator, and then a few months later in Baltimore, where they, the capital was, believe it or no, Annapolis, excuse me, where the capital was, uh, the surrender of his commission. Uh, when he did that, George III said, uh, it can't be. If he does that, he will be the greatest man in the world. Well, he did, and for that moment, at least he was. What they were thinking, and Jefferson writes about this right afterwards, and he's there. It, I think Jefferson actually wrote some of Washington's speech in Annapolis, as a matter of fact, but I can't prove that. Uh, but Jefferson says, you know, one man saved us from the fate that, about, that, that befalls most republics. They were thinking of Caesar, they were thinking of Cromwell. Subsequently, we can think of Napoleon, we can think of uh, Mao, we can think of Castro, we can think of a variety of leaders who never want to leave office. I won't mention one that might still be alive in American politics. Um, but um, uh, <clears throat> the president he sets, I really agree with the way Lindsay put it. Uh, it's often discussed as the two-term precedent, which is ratified as a constitutional amendment in 1951, I believe. Um, the real president, the real precedent is 
in a republic, all leaders, no matter how indispensable, are disposable. That you will not, you know, you do not die in office like a monarch. That's that was the real precedent, I think. Yeah. And um, but I also, and I'll, and I'll conclude here, and let's get on. But the dominant thing we need to remember is when this this was not ever delivered as a, as an address. Yeah. Now both of our commenters already know that, but we haven't mentioned it. It wasn't a speech. It was an open letter to the American people that first appeared, I think, in a Philadelphia paper. And I think it's a New Hampshire paper that gives it the title, The Farewell Address. Um, uh, but that the initial reaction to the address was, oh my God, he can't leave us. Yeah. The American effort had not existed without him as its head. It was like the father saying to the children, you're on your own now. Um, and I and, and that was it was a trauma. Um, nobody thought he was ever going to retire. They presumed he would just win elections until he died. Um, and um, and he and again, he couldn't wait to get back to the place where you're sitting, Kevin. Uh, jo John, uh, Jim uh, referenced something, the stepping away from power in Annapolis, um, and you write about this in, in your book. Uh, this is not the first bit of advice that Washington shared widely with the nation. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about uh, Washington back in 1783 and how he sure. also shared his, his guidance to the nation? Is uh, I think it's called the circular letter. I think it was Yeah, the, the cir letter. circular address to the states. That yeah. was originally called his farewell address. Um, and it, really, I didn't know that. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. You're not yeah. making that up? Nope. <laughs> uh, no, true story. Um, and, and what's fascinating about that is, is first of all, there, there's broad continuity, but most importantly, with the, the power of the gesture itself. And as, as, as Joe and Lindsay say, um, the simple act of, of voluntarily relinquishing power itself was revolutionary. Right. Um, and, and the quote um, that, you know, Joe was referring to uh, by Jefferson actually is the epilogue to, to my book, um, because I think it so perfectly crystallizes Washington throughout his career, but particularly as it's culminated in, in the farewell address. Jefferson said, um, the moderation and virtue of a single character probably prevented this revolution from being closed, as most other have been, by a subversion of the liberty it was intended to establish. And, and certainly those were the stakes in 1783 as well. I mean, the, the normal course of events was that the, the military leader would displace the tyrant and then become a tyrant himself. So, um, you know, talk about the, the, the prevalence of, of, of ancient Roman and Greek um, precedent on this young Republic. This was a real Cincinnatus step he took. He was voluntarily relinquishing power to return to his farm. And it wasn't a pose on his part. It was completely genuine. And the advice he gives in, in 1783 is very similar, albeit you know, subsequently seen through the prism of, of the political fights he saw as president and uh, the, the fights over the ratification of the Jay Treaty and, and America's birth of his foreign policy. But basically says, first of all, you know, this is not a time of celebration. It's a time of, of, of real responsibility because the revolutionaries won. But now we need to really establish the republic and show the world that we can establish a democratic republic on a scale never before seen, right? Because I mean, among other things, it was basically settled wisdom that a democracy couldn't exist, but if it could, it maybe would work in a couple of Swiss cantons. It would never work in, in a country as big as, as, as the 13 colonies. And he warns about the need for national unity. <clears throat> He'd been fighting with the Continental Congress all throughout the war because they couldn't find a, a, a sense of collective resolve or focus on the common good. They didn't want to you know, levy you know, money <clears throat> to support the troops. Um, he said, you know, we, we need to really have discipline, a focus, a primacy of a sense of unity um, and, and to really think as, as citizens. Uh, and, and, you know, I think one of the important points is, you know, independence um, and freedom, you know, can be sort of a state of nature, but liberty requires responsibility. And, and that's what Lincoln, uh, well, excuse me, I'm just finishing a Lincoln book right now, Freudian mm -hmm. Slip. Uh, that's what Washington uh, said in, in the 1783 address, and, and again in 1796. One of the things I, I can do tonight, I, and I hopefully can, can start this now, is uh, bring up a few uh, of, of the 
short quotations that people uh, can pull out of the farewell address. Um, this one actually, I, I'd like to bring up uh, because uh, as we were just discussing, uh, it, if you read down to the bottom there, he refers to the fact that he's given this kind of advice before. Uh, but you see phrases here, uh, disinterested warnings of a parting friend um, who can poss possibly have no personal motive to bias his counsel. Uh, and then he reminds uh, about the circular letter in 1783. Uh, this is the way that he begins. Uh, this is right after, I, I can't remember the exact phrase, uh, here perhaps I should stop. Does that sound right? Where he has a few paragraphs and then he says, here perhaps I should stop. But then he goes on uh, many, many paragraphs longer uh, to give some uh, serious advice to the, to the American people. Um, I wonder, Lindsay, when you see phrases like this, disinterested warnings, a parting friend, is this, uh, a, Tell how does this fit with Washington as as leader, as president, as you've come to study him? Well, Washington really wanted to see himself as above party spirit or faction. He right. really did see himself as president for all of the American people and or, it, it, you know, at least sort of white American people and um, really wanted to represent them regardless of what their maybe their partisan identification was. Now, that might be a little bit uh, rose-colored glassing the situation. He certainly had some partisan sort of biases by the end of his presidency, um, which he didn't necessarily want to admit uh, because he felt like certain sides had been more critical of him or had stirred up uh, domestic rebellions, things like that, that he you know, really blamed on partisan spirit. But he wanted to see himself as above those things. And he did, he's, I mean, certainly the most, I think, apolitical um, president we've had, to be sure. And so, and his leading office gave him sort of more credence to do that. Had he still been in office, there's no way anyone would have seen him as disinterested because he would have been standing for a third term. But by leaving office, he had really sort of put himself in that elevated position that he could give that advice and claim at least to be disinterested, even if some didn't necessarily agree with him. Now, what's really fascinating about the reception to this farewell address is that people who were inclined to think well of him saw that um, saw it as disinterested as he had intended. Those who were inclined to see him as a more political actor, like for example, Thomas Jefferson, thought that it was very political. Joe, uh, disinterested warnings of a parting friend. What would you add? How, how do you read that preface to his guidance? I agree with what Lindsay just said. Let me just try to build on that a little bit. Um, political parties, the founders as a group, including Washington, all regarded political parties as evil vultures that were floating through the political atmosphere. Jefferson even claimed, he said, if I must go to heaven in a party, I prefer not to go at all. Um, they all talked that game and Washington believed in that game. And I said, I think John Adams is the only other president that did as well. They really regarded parties as a threat to the stability of the Republic. Um, and so in Washington's second term, and now, now political scientists think that the creation of political parties is one of the major contributions the founders made to the political thought because it disciplines dissent and creates the possibility of a legitimate opposition, which is a good thing. Washington and Adams, but let's just stick with Washington, was cognitively incapable of thinking of a political party as anything other than an evil intrusion. He really, and he could not see himself as the head of a party. Um, so you might think he's an anachronism and for that reason, but he's a classical figure in that regard. Um, and I would just build on something again that Lindsay, in the second term, the Aurora, the, now you look up in textbooks and they'll say the, uh, the opposing party that comes into existence is called the Democratic Republican Party. Wrong. It's not called the Democratic Republican Party. It's called the Republican Party. The word Democrat and democracy is an epithet in the 18th century. It means mob rule. Democratic Republican doesn't come into existence until 1816 with Monroe. It's, a, it's tricky because that party 
morphs into the Democratic Party, but it's even worse than that. The Federalists morph into the Whigs and the Whigs morph into the Republicans. And so it's really tricky. But the Aurora is the 18th century version of, John, you might comment on this, Fox News. And, um, and <laughs> when uh, they publish forged documents, forged British documents, claiming that Washington throughout the war was really a traitor. He was trying to be Benedict Arnold, but got beat to the punch by Benedict Arnold. I mean, this was just off the top stuff. Um, and actually, among the people commenting on his farewell address was Thomas Paine, who hated him because he didn't think Washington got him out of France fast enough. Um, he said, we must all devoutly pray for his imminent death. And um, so the criticism he was getting in the- Which is pretty funny, by the way, because he, he was famously uh, well, eighth, an atheist, but that's yeah. okay. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, that's true. Yeah, he was. Um, you mean Payne, not Washington. Yeah, Payne, yeah. not Washington. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but um, that the, the level of partisanship in the 1790s is comparable to what we're facing in Washington now. Okay, the press, Avalon, Avalon, you have to listen to this. The, there was no rules for the press. There was no, you know, all the news fit to print. Um, uh, now, Washington stands firmly against that whole thing. He thinks if you have any problems, you can just vote me out in the next election. But that the level of partisanship in the, in the newspapers in the 1790s is uh, scatological. Uh, and Washington really can't understand it. It's just, it doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't understand it. Um, uh, and, uh, and I think he's hurt by it. I think, I think that, that he survives the French and Indian War. He should have been killed, uh, you know, at the Monongahela when he was a young man. He, you know, he should have been killed several times in the course of the War for Independence. He wasn't even wounded, but they wounded him in his second term. They really got him. And, uh, and he, he, he couldn't wait to get out of there. But that, I know we want to move into the discussion of his, his attitude towards political partisanship, but I think the context is what I described and the specific legislation that it really explodes on is the J Treaty mm -hmm. um, uh, and his defense of that. And here, I'll shut up on this after this, I promise you, that, that the word is republic it's not, and that means res publica, things of the public. The public is different from the people. The people are usually misinformed, swoonish in their opinions. That's the reason democracy is not a positive term. The function of a leader is to act in the public interest, even when it's unpopular. Adams carries this to an extreme. I mean, you know, like he's the guy that defends the British troops in, you know, the uh, Boston Massacre. But he always thought if that if what I do is really unpopular, it must be right. You know, but he you know, he could have won the election of 1800 by going to war with France and he refused to do it. And he always said it was the proudest thing he ever did. Um, but that the, the public is a big word here that we need to. And, and Washington internalized that. And it was the job, one of the reasons the Senate has a six-year term is supposedly to make them more likely to vote in the long-term interest of, of, the, of the public. It, the, of course, that's the, the most partisan portion of the government now. Um, all right, I'll shut up. But the public, 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 he represents them. Lindsay, when Joe mentioned the Aurora, yeah, I, I can tell you wanted to say something. Yeah, so one quick thing that I just wanted to sort of highlight when Joe was talking about how personally wounded Washington was, uh, that was really quite intentional on the part of the newspaper editors. So the editor of the Aurora would deliver three copies of his newspaper every day to the front steps of the president's house, mm -hmm. even though Washington was not a subscriber. Um, and he did so intentionally to get under mm -hmm. Washington's skin. And we know that it worked because he ranted and raved about it in cabinet meetings and Jefferson took careful notes. So. This sort of uh, political warfare and the, and the partisan wounds that they were trying to inflict was quite intentional. Let's get a taste of Washington on parties here, and we can uh, uh, further explore this. 
Uh, this is uh, some of his language, and there's uh, much more of it in the address. It serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration, he says, about the spirit of party. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection. It opens the door to foreign influence and corruption, which finds a facilitated access to the government itself through the channels of party passions. Uh, John, first crack at some of this language here. Yeah, let, we're just, leave it up for a second, because th this is, I think, if you had to pick sort of the nut graph that's ripped from the headlines of today, I think this would be it. Particularly, <clears throat> it agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, um, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection, opens the door to foreign influence. I mean, we just had a riot and insurrection that was partisan in its nature this calendar year that resulted in the worst attack on the Capitol since the War of 1812. It was fueled by misinformation and disinformation channeled through partisan media and exacerbated by party figures who put party over country. They kindled the animosity of one part against another based on a lie perpetrated by the then president, but amplified through partisan media and also amplified via social media by some foreign actors who saw an interest in dividing America against itself. It's all there, folks, right there. George Washington warned us, he predicted us, and so especially when anyone else, when anyone out there tries to, um, another phrase for the farewell address, act like a, a, a pretended patriot, uh, you know, really act like that they are more patriotic than anybody else, which is itself, Washington would say, a sin against national unity, if they fed into that stuff that Washington warned against, they're part of the problem. And I don't think, you know, let's not pull any punches about that. Washington made a very explicit warning. We just lived through evidence of it. Um, so it could not be more relevant. And that's precisely why we need to be listening to Washington's farewell address now, today, because we are falling into the traps that he warned us about, you know, almost 250 years ago. John, quickly, you're the one who's on to this most recently with regard to the farewell address. When did they stop making it manual or mandatory to read the farewell address at, before? Is it the full Congress or both houses or just the Senate? Or no, what? The, the, the Senate still reads it every year. Oh, it uh, does? Yes, it does. How uh, ironic. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, look, I, I would argue the House is more, more partisan than, than the Senate, although, you know, it's kind of a jump ball. But, but what I thought you were going to say is, you know, in the wake of the Civil War, uh, it, teaching the farewell address, memorizing it is actually part of the core public school curriculum. And uh, so it is it is it is foremost in people's minds, even though obviously it's easier to memorize the 272 word Gettysburg address. And it's in the wake of World War One for a lot of interesting reasons that it it sort of begins to fade. Um, and, and then the original America First movement uh, of neo-isolationists in the, the, the run-up to World War II by adopting the farewell address, um, I think fundamentally um, creates a misimpression that it's an isolationist document and that it's, it's read at a, a, a German-American Bund Nazi rally in Madison Square Garden, but we'll, we'll get to that later. Yeah, we'll get to foreign policy soon. Uh, Lindsay, can you take us back to the 18th century on some of this language? Uh, John uh, gives us a great way that this speaks to the 21st century. Uh, how would this have been read in September 1796? Like you said, there's an election just around the corner. Yeah, and as I think John alluded to um, at the very beginning, you know, this was a intensely partisan atmosphere. When you think of the challenges that we're facing today in terms of misinformation and disinformation, um, you know, party structures, uh, uh, nativism, fears about sort of foreign interference, all of the things that we feared, they too feared, except they hadn't done it before. And as Joe talked about, they were students of history and they knew that republics typically failed. And let's not forget, the Constitution was actually the country's second chance. So this government was already the country's second chance at getting it right. And so there was such intense fear at this time that one misstep would lead to the nation's undoing. And Washington shared that fear, Adams shared that fear during the Jay Treaty debates that Joe mentioned. 
Adams wrote in his letters back to Abigail that he thought, you know, that either a civil war was coming or, you know, maybe, maybe the Constitution would last another 10 years at most. So that's really the vibe of, of this moment. And one of the things that I think Washington highlights in this sort of party section of his farewell address is that the, the party animosity and um, the intensity of that party spirit can lead us to forget the similarities we have with one another. That yes, we might have differences, we might have regional differences and sectional differences, but we actually have much more in common as Americans than we do as Federalists yeah. or as Republicans. And that, boy, is that a lesson that we really need to learn today. Can I build on her for a thing just for a second? Sure, of course. I think that we need to recover the historical context of the late 18th century for listeners and viewers because and she's doing that right now, okay? Um, and and I'm building on her book in this this remark. If you read Article Two of the Constitution of the United States, I'll bet you can't tell me what the president can do. The definition of the presidency isn't shaped by the Constitution. It's shaped by Washington's own administration. That's the reason I always voted for him as number one president, even more than even even ahead of Lincoln. He creates the republic that Lincoln saves. Um, but let me tell you, what, the average American in the 1780s, uh, 1780s and 90s was born, lived out his or her life and died without a three hour horse ride. The mentality was local, not continental or national. And this is what underlay a perception that was strong, that we created a national government before we were a nation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so it's what one historian called the constitutions of roof without walls. Okay. And that, so Washington is the embodiment of a nation that doesn't exist. It's one of the reasons that that he goes on a trip in his first two years to visit all of the states. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I believe uh, somebody's got a book on on that right now. That, that, uh, Daniel Philbrick. Daniel Philbrick, thank you. Um, <clears throat> that what we need to remember is the United States in the 1780s and 90s was a plural noun. Yeah. Okay. It's, and, and, and by the way, Jefferson will go to his grave believing that we're still a confederacy and not a nation. Um, uh, it's a, Washington is an attempt to create, a, and it's one of the reasons why in the address itself, he keeps trying to get Hamilton to insert a long paragraph on a national university. And Hamilton keeps saying, what in heaven's name does this have to do with the document? No, no, no. And he keeps saying, yo, you got to put it in. It ends up like two sentences. And the, the yeah. reason is he wants to create an institution where Americans from all kinds of different states and sections can come together and in, interact and intermarry. And um, and uh, I don't think George Washington University makes that yet, but um, uh the first institution that does that sort of is West Point, which comes into existence, I think, in 1803. But, right. Uh, and, and actually, Washington's proposing both a, a, a kind of a civic college and, and actually helps purchase some land for it, which is now the Naval Observatory where the vice president lives. Um, um, but that that idea dies. And you're right. Hamilton and he back and forth on it. And Hamilton keeps convincing him to kick it to his mess, annual message to Congress. And that's where most of it right. goes. Um, but if you look at the original farewell, which they have at the New York Public Library, you can see it's literally cut and pasted, that section. Yeah. You know, I think that I'm, we're carrying too much of this, but John, that if you look at that last uh, address to Congress, it's almost FDR. Huh. You know what I mean? It's almost a vision. Well, America Hoover's. That's not a good thing, but it's okay. Pardon me? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sorry. Are you I'm teasing. I'm just teasing. Go on. <laughs> But you have to get beyond that, John. I mean, I, I, but you know what I'm saying? It's a vision very close to what John Quincy Adams will have as president. Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's a vision of, an, of a nation state with, that makes domestic and foreign policy in a robust way. Um, and um, uh, and in that view, Washington is a, is a member of a very small minority in the nation. 
Um, and anybody that 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 anybody that opposes him can lay on to his position. He's a Tory because he is a, attempting to recreate a, a, a monarchy in, in, uh, and of course, Jefferson is the main guy that's doing this behind the scenes. Yeah. Uh, Dumas Malone, who has you know, spent 50 years writing about Jefferson, when he was off, he said, well, you know, Jefferson in the 1790s, I don't really understand what he's doing. I mean, it's been 50 years and you don't understand what he's doing. What he's doing is lying. What he's doing is, is, is treasonable. Uh, he's stabbing Washington in the back. And, um, yeah. and uh, I might be wrong, Kevin, tell me, I've often said to students, I hope I was right, that Jefferson wrote to Martha when he came president, because he was only you know, close, close to Mount Vernon, can I, can I come see you? And she never answered, I don't think, but she, she said, Washington said, I never want that, that man on my property. It's right after Washington's death, in particular, that Martha has a, a, a very powerful statement about how about her distaste for for uh, for Jefferson. Uh, let me let me bring up a little more language here. Uh, we've already been talking about union um, quite a bit, but it, it, there's it is all through this address, right? The word union it appears so much you almost think you're reading Abraham Lincoln, right? It's uh, it is all through this address. Words like unity and union. Here's a taste of it: the unity of government, which constitutes you one people is also now dear to you. By the way, that word now always jumps out at me. Uh, it is justly so, for it is a main pillar in the edifice of your real independence, the support of your tranquility at home, your peace abroad, of your safety, of your prosperity, of that very liberty which you so highly prize. Um, this this statement of union is it's powerful, and, and it's, this is, again, not the only chunk of the address that it uh, touches on this. Uh, John, how do you take this? Uh, this is this is this is core, and it's a little bit what, what Joe was just describing, uh, which is that you know we Washington is willing the creation of a nation. He is very conscious of the fact that um, he's creating a national character through the example of his character, the decisions he makes as a president, which set the precedent, as as Lindsay as Lindsay writes about for the presidency for the the American government. Um, but it is a it is a hard sell because everybody still thinks of themselves as a Virginian first uh, or a, a you know uh, a, a New Yorker first or a South Carolinian first. And, and so Washington is trying to say all the time that, no, this works because of the federal government. It is the guarantor of your liberty. You are not safe from strife. You don't even necessarily have property rights unless we have a strong or a strong central government. And you see, even in that first constitutional convention, you know, the constitution doesn't mention political parties. It does mention journalists, I like to point out, but it doesn't mention political <laughs> parties. Um, but, you know, so people show up to New York um, uh, and, you know, they do the Bill of Rights, and, and but they're representing their constituencies and their conscience, not political parties. That's a later in invention as has been discussed and I'm sure will come up again. But Washington constantly is trying to say, Look, all our interesting differences are nothing if we can't focus on what unites us rather than what divides us. And so in that very early over the debate about ratification of the Constitution, you see so many of the arguments we still see today. Right. It's a debate about, we, you know, largely urban folks saying that they need we need a stronger central government to unite the nation, to give it certain powers. And primarily rural folks saying, no, that stronger central government is a threat to our way of life. Um, and, and that is a continuity in American in American debate that goes from the Constitutional Convention through today. But I, I think Washington mm. was clearly on the side of a stronger central government and emphasizing there is a balance to be struck. This is not all on one side of the ledger. But the primary mission, the primary project is emphasizing the creation of a nation. Full stop. Lindsay, your thoughts on, on Washington's emphasis on union and unity in this address? Yeah, I would like to build off of what John said, which is that, you know, he, he talks about this with both the importance of the union, but also the Constitution. And what he's saying is you cannot have liberty without having a strong central government. Mm -hmm. And this is, again, another incredibly relevant subject for the 21st century and especially for 2021. That mm. certain The goal is to have certain to have rules, to have the recognition of authority, to have obedience to the rule of law will actually safeguard your liberties. You don't get to just have a free-for-all of whatever it is that you want to do. 
Mm. So, um, you know, as a, as a modern society, we accept that you are supposed to stop for red lights and you are not allowed to drive drunk because that is a limitation that we accept to preserve more of the liberties and the freedom and the safety of more American people. Now, obviously, they didn't have cars in 1796 when he was writing this, but the concept is true that as a part of a free society, you have to accept certain limitations. And this is incredibly relevant coming on the heels of the Whiskey Rebellion, which wrapped up less than two years prior to this address. And he does actually allude to the Whiskey Rebellion, in which he says that there is a constitutionally mandated way in which one can air your grievances, one can seek redress for the things that you don't like, the measures that you think are inappropriate. But unless the Constitution is changed, obedience to the Constitution is the true way to be an American. Yep. Joe, let me uh, ask you to address one specific thing that Washington spends quite a bit of time on in his discussion of union and unity, and that's regionalism. He talks about the North. He talks about the South. He talks about the mm. West. Uh, could you help uh, people who are less, less familiar with the 18th century? What is he What is he seeing when he looks at North, South, and particularly West? What is that uh, uh, regional uh, concern of his? Well, in the North, South, the obvious issue is the threat of civil war, and the underlying issue there is slavery. And later in the program, I want to say that I, I wish there was one thing he did talk about at the farewell address that he didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but he said to Jefferson, this was, I think, even before he was president, if there ever is a war between the North and the South, you need to know I'll be with the North. He and says that in Randolph, yeah. Does he really? Okay, I yeah. thought, he, and I think Jefferson repeats it, or, or it's in the Jefferson. But um, uh, and he sends his kids to, you know, the, not his kids, but you know, to Columbia rather than to William and Mary. And um, uh, he becomes a kind of Trojan horse in the middle of Virginia, in some sense. Uh, 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 and um, so that's that. But the the other thing is the West. And, you know, I think John was mentioning that first Pharaoh will address the circular letter of 1783. That is his most lyrical statement of all time, it seems to me, in terms of his vision for the Republic. Um, and you can see it implied in the farewell address, but you have to know about it beforehand. That is, America's future is not with Europe, but it's to the West. Um, and uh, Lafayette says, come with me and we'll go to Grand Tour and we'll do Paris and we'll do uh, Rome and we'll do Berlin. I don't think we'll do London. Um, uh, and he says, no, you come with me. We'll do Detroit. We'll do New Orleans. We'll do Savannah. That's the future. That's the future out there. Um, and as a, as a young man in the Seven Years' War, he knows about what that is out there more than most other political leaders of the time. Yeah. So there is, you know, when you get to the, when you get to the um, Louisiana Purchase, it, it's funny that they think dinosaurs are out there and, um, you know, and, and it's mammoths and all that kind of thing. What, but I might be pushing this too much to diplomacy, but I think that Washington believes that we begin with the largest trust fund that any new nation has ever enjoyed. Okay. Yeah. And we've got this geographic advantage as well on both sides with the Atlantic and the Pacific. He's mostly concerned obviously with the Atlantic, but that, and I will play, uh, maybe John and, and Lindsay can, can disagree with me or we can play this out as an argument. But the Washington's definition of American exceptionalism is exactly the opposite of what most contemporary think people think American exceptionalism is. The contemporary view, which we saw after we won the Cold War, was, aha, now the Russians are gone and we can make the world safe for democracy, as Wilson believed, because we have the model that works everywhere. Washington said, our model is distinctive and unique and exceptional. And for that reason, don't expect it to work in France. OK, the French Revolution is probably going to fail. Um, and um, 
when the Iraq war was going on and I was doing a book tour for a, my biography of Washington, everybody wanted to know what Washington would say about Iraq. And I said, he wouldn't know where Iraq was. And, um, uh, but later when they kept pressing me, I said, he would say, how did we become Britain? <laughs> uh, and, um, and explain that one to me. And uh, uh, that, the, I'm, I'm pressing towards a modern foreign policy, and maybe you don't want to do that yet, Kevin. I want to go there now. The yeah. West, the West, is what drives him there because he believes that that is um, is certainly the future for the next hundred years. That's right. Okay, let's go. Let's go to foreign policy. Uh, this is another uh, uh, small segment of of a, a, a fairly lengthy discussion in the address. Uh, here's a here's a taste. The great rule of conduct for us in regard to foreign nations is in extending our commercial relations to have with them as little political connection as possible. So far as we have already formed engagements, let them be fulfilled with perfect good faith. Here, let us stop. Uh, this is Washington uh, at the end of his presidency. Um, Lindsay, is this how Washington's presidency played out? Did he exercise this kind of foreign policy vision as president across eight years? Yeah, I think for the most part he did. He didn't want to be beholden to any one nation. He recognized that relying too much on one country for defensive support, for economic support, was asking for trouble, especially at a time when France and Great Britain were essentially having the second 100 years war. They were constantly at each other's throats, and it usually pulled Spain and others into the mix. And so the best way out of that was to not get too close to any one side. So, for example, in 1793, when France declares war on Great Britain, the United States and France did have treaties on the books. They had a treaty of amity and commerce and a treaty of defense left over from the Revolutionary War. And they decided that actually at Jefferson's encouragement to interpret the treaty of defense as just that, a defensive treaty. So it said that France and the United States were bound to support one another if they were attacked by their enemies, meaning Great Britain, of course. Um, but because France was the one that declared war, they were not attacked. And therefore, according to Jefferson's legal logic, the United States was not obligated to come to France's assistance, which was convenient because the United States didn't really have an army or navy anyway with which to lend any assistance. But so this concept of trying to sort of balance these two global superpowers was really, um, I think, his main goal for the majority of his presidency, trying to sort of not get too close or having too intense of a relationship with either. It's one of my favorite moments in, in Tocqueville's Democracy in America. He praises Washington for having the steadfastness to maintain that neutrality and, and insist that no one else could have done it. Uh, that always jumps out at me. Uh, John, uh, this uh, this foreign uh, relations statement that Washington has here, can you talk to us about the legacy of that? Uh, take us uh, in past the 18th into the 19th and 20th centuries? Sure. Um, well, I mean, for, first of all, you know, the, the statement of neutrality between France and Britain is itself revolutionary. But Washington, uh, as Joe was indicating, is really fixated on the fact that we have a strategic asset that's unlike any other. Um, uh, you know, and, and I joke in, in my book, it, it, it's a version of what Will Rogers used to say, which is America's got the two best friends any country ever had. Their names are the Atlantic Pacific Ocean. <laughs> we're, 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 we're insulated from the chaos of continental Europe where they've been killed each other for centuries. And, and so that's, that's a strategic asset, particularly at the time, of course, when, you know, distance really inoculates us. And, and um, so he, he says, look, we're no way we're going to become a satellite of another nation. We need to become an independent nation. But what he also says is we need at least 20 years, he says in the farewell address, to build our own strength, military and economic. And then we can start making our own decisions rooted in our sense of interest and sense of justice. So it's not an isolationist statement. It says, look, you don't have permanent alliances with other nations. We're not going to be a satellite of anybody else. We're not going to get dragged into a foreign war. That would be a huge mistake for who we are now as a young nation that needs to build up strength. And it would squander our greatest strategic advantage, which is our, our geographic isolation. This plays out through the 19th century. It's considered basically sacred, but it's, it is easily enforced by the distance, you know, by the fact that, you know, the, the world is, is not, um, it, you, you can't attack America very easily 
uh, it, it, albeit had happened, but um, uh, so so we were fairly isolated. And and you know John Hay, uh, who was Abraham Lincoln's private secretary and secretary of state for uh, William McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt, said that America's foreign policy can be summed up in two words: the gold, the two phrases, the Golden Rule and the Monroe Doctrine. So we have the Monroe Doctrine, and you know that basically says, hey, we're going to stay out of your business. Don't come in our sphere of influence. Um, but you know, there are temptations to empire. What Joe was saying is, look, we're a republic, not an empire. Um, that, that is that is poor foundational founding fathers wisdom. Um, late 19th century, that, that starts to get strained. Uh, by the time we get into the debate over World War I, and I write about this in, in my book, um, it's, it's really fascinating because the debate about we're getting involved in World War I is basically conducted, and, and the ratification of the League of Nations, are both conducted by two Washington biographers, Woodrow Wilson and Henry Cabot Lodge. And they're both arguing that they're defending the Washingtonian tradition. Cabot Lodge is doing it with a little more authenticity because he's saying that, look, we've never gotten involved in a continental fight. Why would we start now? Um, and Wilson is saying, no, the ideals of Washington are at stake. Um, and, and, and a lot of the iconography, once we do get involved in the First World War, uh, involves uh, calling on, on Washington's legacy. Um, and then something really interesting happens. You know, the world doesn't end. America turns the tide of the First World War fairly quickly. And all of a sudden, maybe it looks like Washington wasn't this perfect prophet. You know, we, maybe we can get involved in foreign wars in pretty short order and do good and make the world safe for democracy and all that. So it takes Washington down a peg um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a significant way. Now, there's a backlash to involvement in, in, in the First World War. Um, then when the Second World War comes about, you see the as a group that was called the America First uh, Committee. Um, some of them were anti-Semitic, some of them were, were isolationists uh, recalling, but they use Washington's farewell address as a real avatar to argue against the United States getting involved in the Second World War. This hits an absurd uh, extent when the German-American Bund hosts a rally at Madison Square Garden in New York City um, uh, that functions as an American Nazi party rally. And there's a giant, giant uh, poster, flag, billboard of George Washington in the background. And the keynote address is all uh, someone misappropriating the text of the farewell address. Now, this is paid for by a foreign government. <laughs> so it, it shows how you need to be careful about misappropriations of founding documents. I mean, Washington's warning against foreign influence in our politics. That's one of the reasons to stay out of this. And here you have a foreign government, the Nazis, funding a misappropriation of the farewell dress to argue against getting involved in a foreign war. Um, so it, it, that, by the way, backfires badly on them. Uh, and um, But but the, the legacy of the farewell address um, really starts to fall away for a time as a result of that association with the America Firsters and the the uh, incorrect uh, belief that it's an isolationist document. It's not. He's talking about a foreign policy of independence, about not squandering our strength through false alliances. And no, we shouldn't uh, start trying to export uh, democracy or get involved in foreign fights. We should focus on strengthening ourselves. But once we're strong as a nation and independent as a nation, then we can make decisions based on our own conception of national interest and justice. That's different than an isolationist document. Joe, uh, in, in a recent book of yours, American Dialogue, you have a, a long section on Washington and his foreign policy vision uh, writ large, I think looking not just at the farewell address, but at, at his actions across uh, all of his time as commander in chief in particular, both times. Uh, what can you, what's your read on the, the foreign policy vision of Washington uh, that you would share? That, um there's a portion of his legacy that is no longer relevant. Uh, uh, I, I hear John on that it's not really isolationism, but um, but I don't think Washington ever envisioned us. I mean, well, he did envision us as a world power, um, but I think his vision of us as a world power was close to what John Quincy Adams would say. Mm -hmm. We do not go abroad in search of monsters to destroy. Um, uh, but um, uh, I've lost my train of thought. What did you ask me again? Uh, His foreign policy vision. Um, oh, yeah. No, yeah. Just isolationist. There is, it seems to me, another dimension to Washington's legacy that is very much alive, though different people who claim loyalty to it 
don't always agree about what it means about what we should do. And that's the realistic tradition in uh, American foreign policy. Um, and uh, it, it has its origins in the Melian dialogue of Greece. And uh, it, it is in Washington's terms that nations act solely on the basis of interest. And you should not expect them to act on any other grounds whatsoever. In some sense, all treaties are temporary until that, because the interest might, might particularly change. Um, but in, if you want to carry it into a contemporary American world, um, we care a lot about human rights, but we're not going to war on that. Um, uh, and I think that the person that most embodies it in the mid and late 20th century is George Kennan and his doctrine of containment. Uh, and it's clear that what what realism does well is say, you have to distinguish between what you can and should do and what you cannot and should not do. It cannot be an open-ended uh, foreign policy. Um, which regions of the earth are our national security interests and which aren't? And at least in my humble opinion, Washington would, if you could somehow bring them out, like my, my readers, one, you know, what do you do about Iraq? If there's one place on the planet that you don't want to get involved, it's the Middle East. Um, and uh, if you, it's one place in the Middle East that is like graveyard for all Western values, it's Afghanistan. Um, and so uh, bring it really up to date, I think he would be very supportive of Biden's decision to get us out. And he would think that what you would need to do is not look for not look for scapegoats, but let's try to figure out how we made this mistake in the first place. Um, and I think that um, in some sense, our own understanding of uh, why Britain, why Britain makes the biggest mistake in, in its statecraft history by making war on the United States in 1775, 76, we can understand that now in a way that uh, we couldn't before. Uh, why, how does uh, the world recently arrived world power brimming with confidence, certain of its military and economic supremacy, step into a quagmire that is a war that is both unwinnable and unnecessary? We should know about that. Well, so let me let me um, there's a lot I agree with, Joe, but let me push back just for for, for debate's sake. I saw a grimace on your face, so I know you're going to push back. <laughs> well, yeah, but 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 uh, but uh, on on two points. First of all, I think the core of what you're saying is exactly right, and it, it can be summed up in a number of different ways. But one of which is America is not a colonizing power, right? We're a republic, right. not an empire. That doesn't mean we don't don't have interests as, as an independent nation, but we're not a colonizing power. So if you look at our involvement in World War One and World War Two, um, that's another definition of American exceptionalism. But you know, we we beat back people who were uh, not simply disrupting the balance of power, but, but attacking free and allied nations. Um, and then, and then withdrew. World the only war II, not World War One. Okay. World War Two, but not World War One. We, we don't, we don't claim land. World War One was a mistake. Okay. Well, you and the Nye Commission can debate that, but I'm not going to do that just yet. <laughs> um, the, uh, but you know, the only ground we, ground we ask is, you know, is, is cemeteries to, to bury our dead. Now, yes, in the case of Germany, we have an air force base, but, that's a longer, we don't need to get in that level of detail right now. The, the parallel that intrigues me, though, is the case of the Barbary Pirates, which doesn't occur under Washington exactly. I'm straying into Joe's area. But, but you know, if we're attacked, what do you do? How far do you extend that? How much does the treaty with Morocco uh, mm -hmm. apply? You know, these are imperfect parallels, but they're what we've got given the, the sort of apertures of the time. And, of course, where it begins is we're attacked on 9-11. Um, it's an unprecedented situation that Washington couldn't have imagined. Um, he also, I don't know if he could have imagined Americans attacking their own capital, but that's a separate, you know, but, but an important conversation. Uh, I, I think, think he could have very easily imagined. Well, yeah, I mean, whiskey rebellion, perhaps. But, but, but just would have been a little harder. Yeah, yeah, but, but I'll be, yeah, let me hand the baton to you in a second. But just to finish the thought with regard to foreign policy, um, if you're attacked, then we responded. The, the problem is we responded uh, with an open-ended commitment um, rather than sort of a, a, a more realist or Scowcroftian sort of, you know, you know, we have a limited objective and then we're 
we're, we're, we're going to achieve that and, and get out. And I think that's where that's where the balance occurs, dealing with the, just the different geopolitical realities of today versus 1796. Richard Clark, who was in charge of counterinsurgency under Clinton and early, Bot, or early Bush, said it was as if after Pearl Harbor, we had invaded Mexico. Um, and that's the reason why I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on some of this, because I think that all of the energy and all of the the angst and anguish that was created by that event on September 11th was diverted into an unnecessary war. Are you talking about Iraq or Afghanistan? Both. See, I, I think you got to draw a distinction between the two. Um, I mean, because Iraq was not containing nuclear weapons. Iraq had nothing to do I, with Al Qaeda. I agree with you on that. So those were the rationales for invading Iraq. And I'm going to take us back to 1796. Uh, <laughs> keep us there for just a, a few moments longer. Uh, we've had a great conversation. I hope you'll have time to answer just a few audience questions that have come in. Uh, I don't mean to keep you long uh, because I've already learned a ton from you. But uh, Julie, uh, who is running things behind the scenes, has just a couple of audience questions uh, that we'd love to come to. Uh, Kay Allison asks, about uh, where was it written? When was it written? Did anyone help him write it? I have heard names. Uh, John, I'll go to you first um, uh, as people that have helped uh, write sure. it. Let's see, uh, the, the, the where and the when. The where actually is quite interesting. Uh, the, the where is the, the executive mansion then existing in uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, uh, and um, I, Washington begins writing his farewell address at the end of his first term. He, he does not want to have a second term. And at that time, James Madison is his closest aide, hasn't yet fallen under Jefferson's sway and, and, and all that. Um, and then basically he's persuaded that, uh, that basically the one thing Jefferson and Hamilton can agree on is that Washington's no longer president, the country could have a civil war. So he literally puts it away in, in a shelf in a drawer. Then as he's ending the second term, uh, Hamilton has no longer treasury secretary. He's, uh, um, he's, he's up in, in New York City but Washington becomes corresponding. And because Jefferson and Hamilton have formed uh, the, the Democratic or Republican Party, as, as Joe corrects us, um, he brings Adams in, uh, Hamilton in, and starts corresponding with him. And so uh, that is the primary uh, collaboration. Uh, they bring uh, John Jay in at the very end. So to some extent, you get the Federalist Papers band back together to sort of perform a on-site edit with Hamilton in New York. Uh, but it's a process of back and forth. And the play Hamilton does a very good job of, of, of describing it. I interviewed Lin-Manuel Miranda about it for my book, um, which be, began before the play came out. And I was delighted to find it had a song about the farewell address, which uses some of the actual lines. But uh, what, what Lin-Manuel said is that he designed it um, so that that uh, that uh, Jefferson, that Hamilton would be uh, delivering it as, as, as prose and Washington would turn it into poetry. So some of the words are Hamilton's, but the music and the spirit and the soul is, is Washington's and the public delivery. Um, but that, that's the process. And then it's published in the Philadelphia Daily Advertiser, importantly, because among a whole string of partisan papers in Pennsylvania at the time, the Philadelphia Daily Advertiser is not a partisan paper. It's not a Federalist paper, um, notably, in part because it has congressional printing contracts. But he chose a nonpartisan paper to publish it. Lindsay, yeah, you're the best person to ask uh, for further elaboration. On, I, and I've always wondered why Hamilton, in the sense that Washington had so many people that he trusted, so many people that he could work closely with, and yet Hamilton somehow uh, was at the very top of that list. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Or anything you would add to the story? Yeah. So by 1796, Washington sort of had an ambivalent relationship with the department secretaries that he did have in office. Um, I often affectionately refer to them and Washington certainly thought of them as such. He really didn't want to have cabinet meetings with them. He certainly didn't trust their writing abilities to the same uh, degree that he trusted Hamilton's and frequently still sought out advice on um, his annual addresses, on major moments um, during the presidency and asked Hamilton to sort of draft things for him. One really important element though that Washington insisted upon and um, this was something he told Hamilton when they first talked about it in March of 1796, and then Washington actually sent him the draft. Washington kept Madison's first draft from 1792 oh, yeah. mm -hmm. and insisted that, it in that the final include several paragraphs in the beginning. Um, and it was basically a shot across the bow because Washington was anticipating 
that Madison and Jefferson would be critical of this address and mm -hmm. somehow paint the address as an attempt to garner more power for the executive. And so by including those paragraphs drafted by Madison, he was basically saying, you already knew about a farewell address. You participated in the drafting of a farewell address to keep your mouth shut. And it was a very intentional, very savvy political move. And sure enough, Madison was not publicly um, critical of the address. Very briefly, I think the reason he picked Hamilton is because Hamilton had the most experience being, you know, taking, you know, throughout seven years of the war, he was writing Jefferson's. I mean, when you read the general orders, uh, which are boring as hell throughout the 1770s, <laughs> it, and they're signed by Washington, but he didn't write them. Um, and most of, most of those are written by Hamilton or one of his other aides. Let's and go to he, another question. Like what he called pen men. Washington yeah. was insecure about his own lack of education. I once said, you know, Jefferson went to William & Mary, Adams went to Harvard, Washington went to war. And, um, <laughs> and, he was, and, and that was his educational experience. And that he was conscious of his own lack of literacy. And, uh, and he wanted to surround himself with people who were well-educated. And um, and that's that was Hamilton, that was uh, Lawrence, that was Lafayette. Those are the people. Let's go to another audience question. Um, we have one from Jim about uh, uh, some specifics here. Uh, let's get into the 18th century. How much of Washington's foreign policy advice was driven by the fact that the Spanish maintained control of the Florida's Louisiana territory and the British held Canada? Um, so we have talked about the oceans as keeping America away from foreign powers. And yet, as Jim reminds us, they were there. Uh, uh, who wants to take a first stab at this? The specifics of North American geopolitics. Uh, I I will take a quick stab. That, um, I'm pushing this hard, but I so that if you deal, if if uh, John, uh, you can disagree, why is it called the Continental Army? Why is it called the Continental Congress? It's really only the coast, and in some sense. They're thinking continentally from the beginning. The, the border of the United States under Washington ends with the Mississippi. It was generally regarded, and Jay is most outspoken about this, but Washington understood it too. The Spanish were a declining European power, and they were like a, a, a cow bird, you know, that's the, you know, a bird that sits the nest until you can take over. We, it's great. They're the, Spain's the perfect Western uh, European nation to have have a power over there because we know as soon as the demographic wave hits them, they're gone. Um, and um, I don't think anybody could easily foresee the the uh, you know, the Louisiana Purchase, uh, but um, there is this sense of manifest destiny before 1840s when it becomes a term. And um, and Canada, well, remember at the time, we're talking 1796, we sort of thought we were going to get Canada and we're going to get Cuba. I mean, the War of 1812, we're supposed to win Canada. And of course, it didn't work out that way. Uh, but it's a continental wide uh, vision in pers in certain people's hands, like Aaron Burr goes all cr you know crazy and off the record. But that... Um, I think the presumption was that Florida and most of the West was eventually coming our way. Lindsay, but John, anything you add? Happened with the demography doing it rather than war. Lindsay? Uh, yeah, I think so. I think that, um, as Joe said earlier, you know, Washington was a real realist, and he understood that in 1795, the United States signed this really important treaty with Spain, which gave the uh, Americans access to the Mississippi River, which was a critical element for these oh, Western right. territories yeah. that didn't have the ability to send their goods over the mountain ranges to places like Philadelphia or New York City and desperately needed access to the water before, you know, there were trains and cars and that kind of thing. However, um, Washington was very realistic about the fact that Spain and France were kind of playing off of each other um, regularly, uh, there were complaints about uh, enslaved individuals that self-emancipated towards Florida. And while there were goals about taking Canada, you know, that hadn't happened yet. And so, so much of his foreign policy advice was about 
not getting too close to one country, because if you get too close to Britain, then France is going to get annoyed on the southern border and is maybe going to be more friendly to the uh, self-emancipated enslaved individuals. Or if you get too close to France, then maybe Spain is going to get jealous and is going to cut off access to the river. And so it's really this delicate dance of trying to hold all of these pieces um, together before the United States did have the entire continent and recognizing that as great as we thought we were in 1796, at this point, we were a, still a relatively puny international power and very much um, subject to sort of the whims of international superpowers. And Washington really understood that. Chuck? I mean, look, I, I just say that, remember, most of the European powers thought that democracy would fail, so they'd, they'd, they'd get a chance to re-carve up uh, the, the, the continent uh, at, at the time. And, and the whole Citizen Genet episode in Washington's second term, which was related to the Jay ratification of the treaty and the fact that, uh, you know, Je Jefferson and Madison, basically because Washington declares neutrality, and this is something that hard partisans do, they say, well, if you declare neutrality, it means you're really, you know, you're really siding with the English. Um, and so they played that game to great effect. And then the, 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 the French uh, uh, revolutionary, uh, you know, sort of Jacobins dispatched this guy, Citizen Genet, and part of his deal was to try to, um, you know, either sway the U.S. back to their side or try to build on Louisiana and destabilize the nation. There were a lot of sort of adventuresome plots around that at, at, at the time. And ultimately, um, even Jefferson realized that Genet was a bad deal. And then Genet got wind of the fact that he was about to get his head cut off and he retired to uh, Jamaica, Long Island. Um, yeah. And married the governor's daughter. Correct. We, we have, uh, I, I learned I knew so neither of those things. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, uh, let, there is one topic that we've only barely touched on a few different times tonight, but we haven't explored it uh, closely enough. And we do have an audience question uh, coming in to help us explore that. Um, Brian Hilton is asking about George, uh, my, it says, might George Washington's last will and testament be considered uh. of a different kind? or something of an addendum to his farewell address, particularly with respect to, and this is what I was suggesting, we haven't explored quite enough yeah. uh, the issue of slavery. Uh, John, first thoughts? Yeah, just I, I explicitly say in my book that his last will and testament should be considered a coda to the farewell address. Well, I think Brian uh, might have read your book. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe yes, maybe no. I, I, you know, by, by all means, if he hasn't, he should. Uh, but but um, look, to Washington's discredit certainly by contemporary perspectives the farewell address is silent on the issue of slavery now washington in his in his last will and testament which could be i guess considered the ultimate farewell address uh takes the the decided and unusual among the founding fathers steps uh, uh, uh usual among the founding fathers step of freeing his slaves albeit upon martha's death so um now there's a million different reasons uh, why this is, uh, you know, insufficient and emotionally unsatisfying by contemporary perspectives, all of which are so obvious they don't need to be discussed. Um, it is, you know, it is a core contradiction to the core promise and premise of America. That said, it is a revolutionary act that Washington knows is going to be public. And um, there's a lot of math he doesn't do. For example, it sets up a dynamic where there are a lot of people looking for Martha to die sooner rather than later. Um, but uh, it, th this is a re intended to be and written to be a public statement. And there's a lot of drama around its drafting and which version he chooses. Um, and notably, uh, the other founding fathers who follow him, who uh, are Virginian and, and not named Adams who own slaves, don't do this. Right. They don't release their slaves upon their death. But Washington was making a very clear statement to the country. So I 100 percent believe and argue in my book that it, it can and should be considered sort of the coda to the farewell address where slavery is finally addressed by Washington. Yeah, I, wish, I, wish, oh, Jim, I wish you would have had a paragraph in the farewell address that told his readers and Americans that he intended to free his slaves. Oh, God, yeah. Um, and he sort of did. It's, you know, at that moment, trying to follow his thought process is not easy. He's, he's committed to freeing his slaves once he can get money off of the sale of his Western lands, but he can't get that sold. And so he keeps fudging. And until 1799, he doesn't finally commit. 
and he can only free the slaves he owns, which are slightly less than half of the 317 slaves at Mount Vernon. I think pressure on him is Martha, too. We can't prove this, but I think that Martha is very reluctant to see the slaves freed, in part because they're all intermarried on the plantation or on the, on the farms there. Um, but, I mean, I've, I've, I think that Washington is the greatest leader in American history. I think that slavery is America's original sin and racism is its enduring toxic residue. Sure. We're still living with it. If, was there a chance to end it or we'll put it on the road to extinction before the cotton gin came, before the numbers became impossible? Was it a Shakespearean tragedy and not a Greek tragedy? Yes. Who could have most effectively moved it in that direction? Washington. He failed as a leader on this issue. Uh, now that's a heck of a heck of a standard to apply, and I agree with John in the sense that uh, when we look back from the 21st century, you know, our present perspective gives us uh, an enormous advantage. But they knew. Washington knew that slavery was a contradiction to the, the values of the American Revolution. He said that. He knew that. He knew, and what he kept saying is, we got to wait. Wait until 1808, he said, because yeah. that's, that's when the slave trade will end. But that, um, and, and so in some sense, um, but I would have liked him to say, and I would like the Constitution to have said, Look, we're not going to attempt to end slavery in the states of the Deep South now, but let us all agree that the core principles of this republic uh, cannot allow and permit um, this to exist forever. I and mean, then a house divided cannot stand. Which, by the way, somebody, a Methodist minister used that phrase in 1778. Now, that's where Lincoln got it from. Um, when's, when's the last word on this important subject? Yeah, so um, the historian of of slavery, Annette Gordon Reed has said that she thought she thinks that um, George Washington was deeply concerned that if he spoke out about slavery during his lifetime, it would um, cause irreparable harm and divide the nation. Now, whether or not that's true, I don't know, but that's certainly what he thought. And so that is why he didn't say anything during his lifetime. Now, his will was certainly more than nothing. It was more than some people did. It was less than others did. Um, and so I think that in some ways it's a little bit of certainly wasn't taking the easy road out because it wasn't, but it also wasn't really taking a, a super principled stand because he enjoyed the, the labor and their time while he was still alive. So I think, you know, the way I see it as it was, it was more than nothing, but it certainly wasn't enough. Well, I, and I think Annette's absolutely right. And let's remember, we began with the union his commitment to the union. And if you raise the question of slavery at all in a frontal way, you risk that. And that's one that he was most terrified of. You, you, we got to keep it off the national agenda until uh, at some point in time when we can really face it squarely until the Republic is sufficiently stable to survive the debate. I'm going to bring things to a close by asking each of you to, to just uh, go to Claire's question. This is going to be my question, but I see that we actually had one. We, uh, Julie and I were talking about this. We wanted you to close on this point. Uh, biggest takeaway for you, and I, I'll ask it this way to each of you. I'll start with John. Um, why, why would you want people to, to continue reading uh, the farewell address now 225 years later? What's the biggest takeaway for you? Washington warned us about the forces that can destroy democratic republics. The document contains all the hard-worn wisdom of his life, and it is a prophetic document. And in particular, his warnings against hyper-partisanship, uh, foreign wars, excessive debt, and foreign interference in our domestic politics are ripped from the headlines of today. And if I had to pick one of those that I would argue that Washington was most concerned about and we should be most concerned about, it's hyper-partisanship. It's putting party over country. That's the forces that we are playing with today, and it is risking the success of our republic. Lindsay, your biggest takeaway, why would why should people continue to turn to this document now? 
Well, I agree with everything John said. I would actually add just one element about the foreign policy piece that dovetails really nicely we didn't quite touch on, which was that Washington warned against allowing um, emotions for other nations, for foreign nations to color our ideas against our fellow Americans, to, to color our ability to stand as a United Nation. And I think that that gets at really the same point, which is that stop allowing whether it be partisan identity or foreign policy identity to make us forget what we have in common, to make us forget our common ties and instead see those differences. So it's really just stop looking for the divisions and instead look for the things that we have that bind us together. Joe, last word. They both of my colleagues here have done a great job, but John and Lindsay, and I, so I can't, I echo their view. Um, as a teacher for 44 years, um, uh, many students these days don't think anything happened before they were born. Um, and um, uh, the very well addressed a document that because it will be so alien to so many of them, I want them to understand it. It's like leaving the president, going to a foreign country and learning to think and speak a, a different language. And the language that Washington speaks is, for all the reasons John mentioned, desperately in need, desperately uh, absent from the center of American politics, especially at the congressional and pre presidential level. Um, uh, the public interest is something that nobody understands now. And to even suggest that's your highest priority is to mean that you're uh, not qualified to serve. Um, Washington would never run, neither, neither would any of the other four presidents that I've mentioned earlier, they would never run for public office or for the presidency in the current political climate. They would regard it as prostitution. I it's a way of comparing where we were to where we are and looking back and learning something about where we need to be in the future. Thank you so much, uh, John Avalon, Lindsay Trevinsky, Joseph Ellis. It's been a great conversation. I have learned a lot. Uh, it's an important document, and thank you for helping uh, so many people out there better understand it, why it remains relevant today. On behalf of Mount Vernon, uh, to all of you out there, thank you so much for joining us here tonight. Uh, we hope to see you again soon. Thank you, and good night.